Hello, my name is Dr. Chester Griffiths. I'd like to discuss with you free nasal breathing, my philosophy and evolution during my career, to discuss the surgical options that are available to you to obtain the quality of life for free nasal breathing, which includes septoplasty, straightening the divider in the nose, nasal valve mid-nose reconstruction, which is a very important a physiologic area that has been appreciated uh, during my career to allow the sensation of breathing uh, to the brain and turbinate reduction surgery, which is shrinking the size of the sponge elastic tissues, which may be blocking in the nasal passages. I'd like to introduce myself to you. I'm one of the co-founders of the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, uh, director of Pacific Head and Neck, which is the centers of excellence of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and facial plastic surgery. Additionally, I am the chief of endonasal endoscopic skull base surgery at St. John's Hospital, which is brain surgery through the nose. I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, as well as a diplomat of the American Board of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Since 1994, I've been teaching residents at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and hold the position of associate clinical professor. I'm honored to be the team maxillofacial plastic surgeon of the Los Angeles Kings Ice Hockey Club for the last 21 years. But before going on to the discussion of free nasal breathing, I thought I'd introduce you to the novel Pacific Neuroscience Institute, of which I am one of the directors of the Eye, Ear, and Skull Base Center. Pacific Neuroscience Institute is a novel approach of privademics, which brings personalized private practice patient-centered care with the academic rigor of research, curiosity, and discovery. Our 39 neuroscientists in our institute specialize in the neurosciences sciences from the clavicle to the follicle. Let's talk a little bit about quality of life of free nasal breathing and the health issues related to the inability to freely breathe through the nose, related to septal deviation, nasal valve collapse, turbinate hypertrophy, uh, individually or as a conglomerate. One of the most important uh, foundational issues is that we are obligate nasal breathers. With difficulty breathing through the nose, due to nas with nasal congestion and facial pressure, we have all kinds of different symptoms of most commonly sleep disturbance. Uh, my patients mainly complain of that with sleep disordered breathing due to mouth breathing and the loss of the anchor of the tongue, snoring and even sleep apnea. Headaches and memory issues are a result of hypoventilation and hypooxygenation, and of course during the day, uh, decrease in athletic performance. Over the last three decades and 33 years of clinical practice, my technique has evolved, and I'd like to share uh, the advances of uh, my procedures that have resulted in minimally invasive uh, techniques. I performed over 4,000 nasal surgery, surgical procedures during that time. I would recommend that you pause and review the presentation during the course of it, because there's a lot of information uh, that I'll be presenting. So the nasal septum is cartilage in the front of the nose and bone in the back of the nose. And we use that advantage to be able to reconstruct uh, the functionally and, and structurally uh, the nasal cavities. This is demonstrating a straight nasal septum dividing the, the nose in the right and left cavities. These are the inferior turbinates and you see they're quite long and voluminous. This is an, a coronal plane demonstrating the same. This is a CAT scan demonstrating the nasal swell body. This nasal swell body is a lattice of nerves that gives sensory feedback to the brain that airflow is passing by. When this area is blocked and you don't have the sensation of breathing, you will be uh, resorting to mouth breathing. One of the advances in my practice is this amazing Cone B3, 3D maxillofacial CAT scan that is low dose in 10 seconds. It's one eighth the dose of a conventional CAT scan and it gives a true 3D uh, rendition. 
we have these in our offices that allow us to see the architecture and the roadmap of your nose and sinuses and your septum, along with diagnosing any coexisting uh, issues that may be uh, resulting in the nasal obstruction. This is an example of the CAT scan in three planes that occurs in 10 seconds, high definition and low dose. The deviated septum is caused either from incidental or overt trauma. Incidental trauma occurs usually in childhood or adolescence. It may result in blockage either one side or, or both, or may result in the cartilage in the mid nose being dislocated. Um, this is a normal septum in the midline. This is a septal spur impinging into the inferior and metal turbinates, which may be a cause of headaches. This is a C-shaped uh, deviation, an S-shaped deviation, and a deviated septum off the anterior nasal spine. This is a, a depiction of a deviated septum over to the left side, and this is an endoscopic view demonstrating the nasal septal spur impinging into the middle turbinate. This is showing a young man with a very severe anterior caudal or anterior base of the nostril uh, obstruction. Um, this is intraoperatively uh, demonstrating a near complete obstruction of that uh, nostril, and this is postoperatively after repair. Again, the CAT scan is so important because it really shows the front to the back, uh, which may not be evident uh, on anterior examination. Um, this is depicting a uh, septal spur impinging into the lateral nasal wall, causing airflow blockage and, and possibly headaches. This is an example of a contrabilosa, which is an anomaly occurring in 5% of people where one of the sinuses grows into the bone of the middle turbinate, expanding it. Concha is a shell, bilosa is a balloon. That expansion does cause obstruction. But in this particular case, along with that, there's fractures of this nasal pyramid, as you see by these uh, uh, lines, and resulting uh, accordion nature of the nasal septum with deviation and a spur into the inferior turbinate. Let's talk a little bit about the turbinates, these human air radiators. Um, they are functional to clean, warm, and moisten the air. Uh, therefore, filtering, humidifying the air and temperature regulation, bringing uh, the air down to the lungs that's clean, humidified to at least 90%, and temperature regulated to 98.7. Their paired structures, inferior and middle turbinates, are the most important middle inferior turbinate for nasal breathing and the middle turbinate for a nasal sensation of, of breathing. This is demonstrating the lateral wall of the nose, and you can see the length of that inferior turbinate. Uh, this is the inferior, middle, and the superior turbinate. And you can see the lattice of nasal sensory nerves that give the sensation of nasal breathing. So there's three to four in each nasal cavity. They can swell from side to side um, with the nasal cycle, and we'll review that. Uh, or they can swell due to allergy, emotion, hormones, or infections. All of this swelling will result in nasal obstruction. So what is the nasal cycle? Uh, it's an alternating neurogenic physiologic swelling on one side and shrinking on the contralateral side. Depicted here, this is the enlarged uh, turbinate with the airway blocked and these other turbinate being shrunk with the normal airway. This is a CAT scan demonstrating the same with the swollen nasal turbinate on the right and the shrunk nasal turbinate on the left side with the normal airway depicted by black airspace. It occurs every 45 to 90 minutes all day long, including when you're asleep. One side swells, the other side shrinks. And this is the important aspect in that when the side opposite the blockage swells, this results in complete obstruction. So while you're asleep, you may go to sleep breathing through your nose, but then when the nasal cycle occurs, the blocked side obstructs, and which leads to na uh, oral, oral breathing and mouth breathing. This is demonstrating that cycle from side to side from right and left nasal airflow. This is an example of a septal bone spur 
as you see, this is impinging into the inferior turbinate. This may cause headaches, but it definitely causes airflow blockage. This is a surgical specimen showing the size, about two centimeters in size, but by one centimeter of a nasal septal spur. So you can really uh, understand how this can cause headaches. One of the uh, very interesting aspects during my career is the understanding of the mid-nose nasal valve airflow sensation as it impacts nasal breathing with the nasal swell body and the anterior edge of the middle turbinate. As you see here, the nasal valve is created by a 10 to 15 degree angle between the septum and the mid-nose. When it's collapsed, this causes the airflow to come down into the inferior aspect of the nose, and it does not stimulate the nasal swell body or the middle turbinate. Therefore, even though you may be open in the inferior aspect, you sense that you cannot breathe and thus mouth breathe. This is classified by this hourglass deformity, and you can see it uh, here in this lady. One of the um, aspects of uh, the diagnosis is the collapse is by pulling the uh, skin laterally of the cheek, and if that improves the breathing, that is the diagnosis. You can see how as she's breathing, this valve is collapsing. There and there. So normal airflow dynamics, these are, um, this is a fluid dynamic study showing the normal parabolic curve. And again, this is important to stimulate this mid-nose area, giving the sensation of breathing. And if you don't address this and just address the septum, many times patients will uh, still complain that they can't breathe because they don't have the sensation of breathing. This is showing that normal uh, parabolic curve. Additionally, when the nasal trip drops at times, we need to strengthen that tip support to allow that parabolic curve to occur. Another aspect of my technique over the years is the packingless nasal surgery. I do not use nasal packing. This started back when I was a chief resident in 1989 uh, at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and we published this uh, uh, that year uh, as an alternative to packing. Packing historically has been used to stop bleeding, to prevent hematomas, and as that pressure bolster, and to temporarily maintain the septum in the midline. It is uncomfortable and usually removed in two to three days. But as an alternative to that, suturing the septum in a quilt-like fashion with an absorbable suture maintains the septum in the midline. It prevents a hematoma from developing. And over the three to four weeks uh, of the resorption, that septum solidifies in the midline, breaking the cartilage memory and preventing redeviation. Most importantly, we don't have to pack the nose. This is a depiction of the original whip stitch quilting uh, picture of the article. And this is just uh, defining the cartilage and bone support strut that we talked about at the nasal tibia area, which may be utilized to give tip support to then allow the parabolic curve of nasal breathing. This is actually depicted in this picture. This is a wildly deviated S-shaped septum preoperatively. This is the intraoperative uh, dissection and exposure of that uh, S-shaped septum. It's warped, it's weak, and in order to get it back into the midline and to give tip support, we had to use a bone graft from the back of the nose to as sort of an eye beam to give structural uh, support and strength and to give and to maintain that septum back into the midline. Let's talk a little bit about the turbinates. Again, in the evolution of my career, of the, my technique, we used to cut the turbinate out. Now we don't. We leave the physiologic volume of tissue. We just shrink it back to its normal functional size, not the swollen size. 
utilizing heat uh, into the sponge, sort of a shrink wrapping. Initially, we used lasers, but now we use the heat of, radio of a radio frequency probe, similar to your microwave. This is just showing the uh, airway blockage and open, and this is the radio frequency probe going into the sponge-like tissue and then delivering the heat, shrinking it, and then a scar band occurs, and that scar band prevents the uh, radical expansion of the uh, uh, turbinates that would cause blockage. They still have their physiologic function as the size of the turbinate remains pretty much the same. They're just shrunk down to a normal physiologic size. Again, the reconstruction of the mid-nose uh, in my uh, evolution in my career, attention and understanding of this very important feedback me mechanism of breathing was, was uh, uh, discovered. As you see here, there's preoperative collapse. This blocks the mid-nose, this prevents the parabolic curve of airflow to stimulate the nasal swell body and the anterior edge of the middle turbinate, and thus people will feel they can't breathe. Using collapse test, then they can breathe. We repurpose the tissue of the septum, and this is another very important advance because we use the local tissue, the same, same tissue with the same uh, genomic signature of the nose. Therefore, when we used uh, ear cartilage or rib cartilage, uh, the immune system would see the cartilage signature and react to it and resorb it. Uh, so using the, the tissue from the same area with the same genomic signature diminishes the resorption. Of course, we don't have to perform another procedure with another incision in another location uh, of your ear or your rib. Uh, so it's your tissue and it's locally harvested. This is a intraoperative depiction of, of this, these two cartilage toothpicks in between the septum, reconstructing that nasal uh, valvular mid-nose area. And this is the example of the amount of tissue we can harvest for the dorsal grafts, the cartilage uh, grafts uh, in the mid-nose and the columellar kind of L-strut graft. If you're interested to in seeing a surgical video, you can scan this QR code uh, to see actually uh, the endoscopic aspect of placing these uh, uh, mid-nose uh, spreader grafts. So let's go over some examples. Um, this is a 32-year-old young lady with a congenital from birth and childhood severe nasal obstruction. She has a curved nasal dorsum over to the right side, a collapse of the uh, mid-nose. You can really see it on, on the oblique view here with a totic nasal tip. Again, the position of the tip is important for that parabolic curve. She has what's called a short upper lip deformity with a very prominent anterior nasal spine and overprojected tip. And of course, this very obstructed left nostril from a septal dislocation. One of the aspects of uh, preoperative planning and education is morphing. And this is a very valuable tool. Again, another advance. I could go through and show the predicted result. And with this, we can discuss uh, expectations and desires and it alleviates a uh, patient's fears and apprehensions because now it takes the abstract aspect of a procedure and really uh, puts it into three-dimensional uh, understanding. And again, this is showing the severe deviation of the septum in the nostril and the repair. So preoperative morphing has been a very, very valuable tool and an evolutionary uh, uh, piece of of an armamentarium in, in my approach. So what is the result? I would say it's better than morphing. Here she is, the nose is completely straight, the mid-nose deflection and depression is addressed, the tip is in a better position, this mid-nose is not collapsed, as you see. The anterior nasal spine, uh, short upper lip deformity is addressed. Um, the nasal dorsum is now uh, pleasant and straight. And the nostrils are 
uh, definitively uh, improved. You can see the nostril on this side completely obstructed here. So she's able to breathe. The asymmetries are corrected. It's very, very pleasant, natural appearing nose, and it fits perfectly to her face. This is a 30-year-old gentleman with a traumatic fracture and severe nasal obstruction. As you see, he's got deviation of his nasal pyramid over to the right side with a depression and a depression on the on the on the excuse me on the left side depression and a depression on the right. So bilateral mid nose obstruction. The nasal dorsum height is not uh, abnormal, but as you see, he has an ex extremely obstructed and blocked left nostril due to that nasal septal deviation. This is postoperatively, his nose now is straight, the strut grafts are in place, the oblique view is now demonstrating the fullness and the uh, improvement in the structural uh, support. The uh, side view has not changed much, but now you can really see the nose is straight, the nostrils are equal, and he's able to breathe. Uh, on both sides. So again, the nose is straight, able to breathe, the asymmetries are corrected, and he's got a very natural appearing uh, nose. This is a 77-year-old lady with a cosmetic rhinoplasty 47 years ago. Over time, due to lack of structural support, the nose has collapsed. She does not care how it looks now because she can't breathe. She has sleeping problems and headaches, and you can see the hourglass deformity here. You can see the uh, saddle nose deformity here, and the collapse of her nostrils. When she would breathe in, they would completely close. She cannot breathe. After surgery, the, with the cartilage grafting and reconstruction, you can see the nasal dorsum now is pleasant and, and uh, restructurally fortified. Uh, the saddle nose is now taken care of with the nasal tip being supported and uh, in a good anatomic position and the nostrils with, with LR uh, batten grafts are now are supported and are 50% uh, larger from here to here. She is very happy, of course, that she's able to breathe. She's sleeping better, headaches are improved, and she additionally loves the appearance. This is a young lady with two prior rhinoplasties, bilateral valve collapse on the right and the left side, a saddle nose, and a completely obstructed left nostril. Postoperatively, with the grafting, you can see that her nasal dorsum is straight, the tip is back into the midline. The saddle nose deformity has been corrected. Uh, here you can see the mid nose collapse is also corrected, and the radically improved nostril symmetry and the ability to breathe. Quickly, this is just simple uh, nasal valve reconstruction with two uh, cartilage strips in, a, in an elderly gentleman. This is a unilateral nasal fracture with dislocation of the uh, upper lateral cartilage. And now you can see that with the cartilage graft, it not only is symmetric, but she is able to breathe. Same thing with this gentleman with a uh, nasal valve collapse on the right nasal strut graft, and now he's able to breathe. The procedure is performed in an outpatient under sedative anesthesia, either at St. John's Health Center, Ambulatory Surgery Center, or our surgery center at West Wilshire Medical Surgical Center, who has 25 years of superlative service. There is no packing. We start the nasal sinus rinse immediately. There is oozing for 24 hours, and, and the wash and afrin does help that. The next day, people are up and around, walking, eating normally. We ask not to do any straining or any uh, impact aerobics that may cause a nosebleed for two weeks. The nasal cast is removed in three to seven days after surgery. Ice is paramount uh, every two hours on the nose, Advil and Tylenol throughout the day. And at times, we give a uh, mild opioid for breakthrough breathing, uh, breakthrough uh, uh, pain but there's truly not severe pain with this procedure. So in conclusion, what are the benefits of free nasal breathing? Naturally, easier breathing through the nose and natural passage. Improved sleep, reduction or elimination of snoring. And this is a research study that documented 
the effect of nasal versus oral breathing. As noted, the current study demonstrated a profound increase in obstructive sleep apnea severity in mouth breathing as compared with nasal breathing during sleep. And that's related to the loss of the tongue, tongue anchor. When you open your mouth, your tongue slides back into the back of the throat, causing the obstruction, and then people struggle to breathe while they're asleep, not allowing them to get into any deeper planes of sleep. This is the normal airway with the tongue in its normal anatomic position when we're in occlusion with our mouth closed with a clear nasal airway, the objective of what we're talking about. More benefits is improved oxygenation because of increased volume of air into the lungs. Due to this improved oxygenation, patients of mine have told me their memory uh, is better. But definitely during the day, there's an improved athletic activity. This lady was one of my patients who had four prior rhinoplasty procedures. She was a nasal cripple. She could not breathe through her nose. And after surgery, look at my nose. It was collapsed. It was falling close to my chin and I couldn't breathe and I've never been so happy in my life. It is perfect. And thank you. I think everyone should come here and get their nose done immediately because look at my nose. It's perfect. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. So in conclusion, septoplasty alone with turbinate reduction or in combination with mid-nose reconstruction with cartilage grafting from the nose without packing with def definition of the process by intraoperative CAT scan and utilizing the grafts from the nose without, uh, again, nasal packing is definitely a evolution of my technique to be able to offer uh, uh, great results for my patients. This is a great book to read about breathing. And as it's noted, there's a new science of the lost art. And in conclusion, this is my, my one other passion, which is ice hockey as the team doctor for the Kings, but also playing competitively with my son. Uh, he's now in college and he's grown a little bit bigger than I am now, but I think I still have the weight advantage. Anyway, uh, if there's any questions related to this, please do not hesitate to contact me at any time. I hope this review has helped you understand prenasal breathing and my approach. Thank you.